Good to see everyone here this evening. If you uh, will turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9, we'll continue our study in that text. We noted last time, as we continued through this series of trumpets, that uh, we heard the, uh, the fifth trumpet sound, and we suggested that there may have been an allusion there to the emperor cult. Uh, Apollyon and its uh, similarity to Apollo, the imagery of the locust that is associated with Apollo as well, the fact that the Roman emperors used that image, uh, all would suggest that this might have had a more immediate context among the first readers of Revelation than perhaps it does to us. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know what exposure you've had to the book of Revelation before, and I don't know if you've ever... Uh, had this particular interpretation presented to you. Uh, I think it's very common for people to look at the book of Revelation and say, well, it's just a generic story. It's about good versus evil, and it's not limited to any one time or one place. Well, uh, I do think that good and evil is, of course, at the heart of the story, God versus Satan. But we have to remember that it was written to a specific group of people at a specific group of time who were facing a specific situation. And the book would have meant something specific to those people, not just a generic message about good and evil, but about the evil in their day and how God was going to overcome it. Now, we might extrapolate from that the application to our lives that if God took care of them, he certainly will take care of us, and that the God who controlled the forces of history to destroy their enemy in the past can be relied upon to do the same thing whenever God's people are confronted with a great enemy. I think that's surely an application of the book of Revelation uh, to any generation. Uh, But that doesn't mean that it didn't have a specific message to the people that first read it and that the imagery would not have communicated something that they were very familiar with. And so those two understandings are not necessarily incompatible Uh, but we do want to uh, try to make the case for the context as much as we can as we go throughout the book. And so let's look now at the sixth trumpet, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 13. The sixth angel sounded, And I heard a voice from God uh, from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels, who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Uh, You see on the screen the picture there of an altar with four horns on it at the corners. This is very common. Uh, This is an example from Beersheba, but certainly is not the only altar in the world that had four horns on the edges of it. Most ancient altars were built this way. As a matter of fact, it's unusual to find one that doesn't have four horns on it. And so the imagery would have been uh, very immediate to the people in the ancient world. Um, You think about the fact that this description now comes from the altar, and and before we go on with that, remember that this is not six events. This is not a series of six things that are going to happen in chronological order or sequence. uh, These are, so far, six descriptions of the same thing that God is going to destroy the enemy of his people. And sometimes you can describe that like a volcano erupting. Sometimes you can describe that like a a great tree being felled. Sometimes you can describe that like the stars falling out of the sky. Sometimes you can describe that as a plague of locusts. And there are maybe, you know, a couple dozen different ways to describe God's anger against a sinful nation. But that's all we're looking at here. We're not looking at a series of events. We're looking at complementary portraits of what God is going to do. And I think you have uh, noticed so far as we've gone throughout the book that it's not just six pictures, that they are six growing pictures, as it were, that every time we get an image of what God is going to do to this wicked nation, that the image is a little bit more intense It is a little bit more dramatic. Uh, As we're seeing here, these last three trumpets certainly take up more literary space than the first four. And so the farther we go into the description, the more detailed, the more graphic, the more symbolic it gets, and the more forceful it becomes. 
So the sixth trumpet is another view of what God is going to do to these uh, to this wicked nation, uh, and it is now presented in the form of a judgment that comes from the altar. And there is there's two things about an altar uh, that's perhaps significant. First, an altar is a place of sacrifice, a place of death. Altars are associated with death. And so when we see the altar, of course, we're reminded of what we saw back in chapter 6, the souls who had been slain and they were underneath the altar. Their lives had been given on the altar, as it were. But it also suggests that uh, there is going to be the death maybe of the enemy, that something's going to get slaughtered here and that God is going to bring that forth. We're going to see, as, as it says in verse 13, that the voice that unleashes this destruction comes from the horns of the altar, the place where death is meted out. Uh, but the altar, on the other hand, is also a place of sanctuary, a place of appeal. And you could grab hold on the horns of an altar in ancient times and ask for immunity or sanctuary if you were condemned. Uh, that's certainly the kind of picture that we get there in chapter 6. The souls underneath the altar are crying out to God, how long? Uh, appealing to God, making their cry to Him. And in chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, uh, we have there that the angel came and gave, poured incense on the altar and added it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God. And so it has that dual kind of role that it is a place of death, but it is also a place of safety. And that kind of mirrors the image that we have seen so far in the book, that God is unleashing his wrath against the enemies of God's people, but he has also protected his own people. Remember the interlude that we saw in chapter 7, that God sealed his people. He marked them as belonging to him so that they will not be hurt like the plagues of Egypt did not hurt God's people as well. And so it is this kind of two-sided image, destruction and protection for others. And the fact that the voice comes from the horns of the altar I think is significant. Because in apocalyptic literature, horns are symbols of power. And we're going to see that in some of the images that are coming up in some following chapters. Uh, beasts that have many horns on them. And if you go back to Daniel, you hear about these beasts that have big horns and little horns, and little horns that grow into be big horns. Uh, they are images of power, the ability to destroy, kind of like a horned animal has this danger about him that he is deadly and he can use those as a weapon. That's the imagery in apocalyptic literature that a horn is an instrument of God's power uh, to destroy. So the picture that is being painted for us in verse 13 is that a voice of judgment is coming forth from the source of divine power, the horns of the altar, the, the uh, voice is going forth that death is now going to be unleashed, but perhaps protection for others as well. And the message says, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Uh, it seems to me that these four angels are probably the same that we saw in chapter 7 and verse 1, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. And so the picture there is the earth is kind of like an altar on which a death is going to take place, holding back the, fourth, the four winds of the earth so that they would not destroy. Well, now the time has come to release the destructive force that God holds in his hand, and he is now going to unleash his power uh, upon the earth. And it might be that, uh, again, that these are evil angels. We suggested that perhaps about the angel in chapter 9 and verse 11, the angel of the abyss that has the name destruction or destroyer. That one of the ways God punishes evil people is that he allows evil in the world, because evil always has terrible consequences. And God sometimes allows people to just simply suffer the consequences of evil as their punishment. And it seems to me that you could argue that that is what God is doing here as well. 
that uh, he is going to release these destructive forces, uh, let these evil beings do their thing on these wicked people so that they are judged. And the fact that they are at the river Euphrates is, of course, significant. Of course, in the uh, Old Testament, the Euphrates is the natural northeastern boundary of Palestine. Remember when God spoke to Abraham, he said that I will give your descendants this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, that is the river Euphrates. It was the northernmost boundary of Israel, but even more, it is the place where Israel's greatest enemies came from. The Babylonians and the Assyrians both came crossing the Euphrates to come to Israel. But it's not just that that is a boundary where an enemy comes from, because we could also say, well, what about Egypt? Uh, Egypt is to the south, and they're not at the Euphrates. No, the imagery is more than just that there's an enemy over there. The imagery is that this is typically where God brings the destruction from. And it's not a picture that bad things are going to happen, and, you know, God is just going to let it happen. No, God is making it happen. The consistent picture of the Old Testament is that when an army comes across the Euphrates, they come because God called them to come and destroy an evil nation. Uh, If you're unfamiliar with where the Euphrates River is, it runs uh, here from the uh, Mesopotamian River Valley all the way uh, the northern part of it, way up here in Carchemish. And so Israel was from the river of Egypt all the way up to the northern edge here. And the Babylonians, when they came, of course, came and crossed the Euphrates. The Assyrians did the same thing. Isaiah 7 and verse 20, we see this imagery used uh, by the prophet Isaiah concerning the wicked people of his day. In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor hired from regions beyond the Euphrates. And so this idea of God is going to humiliate his people and do it with an army from the Euphrates. Isaiah 8, 7, Behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates. And that's not a flood. He's talking there about the Babylonian army like a flood. They're going to invade your land. They're going to flood your land like a river over its banks. Even the king of Assyria and all its glory... It will rise up over its channels, go over all its banks. It will sweep into Judah, overflow and pass through, and reach even to the neck. Uh, And so God is going to make them swarm over. Jeremiah 1.14, The Lord said to me, Out of the north the evil will break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. Crossing the Euphrates, the Babylonians would come from the north and at God's bidding do his uh, work. And so that's the picture here, that God is going to unleash his forces. And now remember, north here is not north. It's not a direction on a map. It's a symbolic direction. In the Old Testament, that's where these armies came from. And so the symbolism is that God is going to unleash a great destructive power that he is called. But it's not a historical picture that we're looking at here. And you'll notice something else, verse 15. This would have been part of the comfort of the book of Revelation. The four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. This didn't take God by surprise. You know, oh, my people are in trouble. I'll need to do something about that. No. John says that they were prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year that God knew his people were going to be in trouble and he had already prepared their deliverance. He had already prepared the force that he was going to use to deliver them. Just like God raised up the Babylonians because he had a job in mind for them to punish Judah. Just like he gave power to the Assyrians to punish Israel and he gave power to the Medes to punish Babylon. That's what God does. He raises one nation to destroy another. And here God is raising this great army, and he's always planned on doing it. He always knew this was going to to happen, and so God is in control. And you'll notice here that uh, now the killing begins. This is uh, the first time we've heard this in the book, unless I'm mistaken. 
that now they would kill a third of mankind. So far we've heard hurting the grass and hurting the trees and a third of the oil and a third of the wine, uh, but now it's a third of mankind is killed. And as we said a moment ago, uh, the destruction tends to become more detailed and more intense every time it is told to us, and that is what we're getting here as well. And there is, uh, in keeping with the imagery we've seen throughout this text, some more Exodus imagery here. In the plague of hail that came upon Egypt, the Bible says in Exodus 9 and verse 25 that the, play, uh, the hail killed the Egyptians who were not inside. Those that were out in the fields that day died because of the hail. And so just like God was unleashing his wrath against an idolatrous nation that was persecuting his people in Egypt, he's doing the same thing here with Rome. A, a nation that is worshiping its men as gods, hurting God's people, and so God is going to afflict them. And the number of the armies uh, of horsemen, verse 16, was 200 million. Yeah, I got lucky this time. My Bible doesn't say myriads of myriads. It, just, it adds the numbers for me, so I don't have to do the math. Uh, 200 million, I heard the number of them. Now, there is no special symbolism to the number 200 million. Um, although people have tried to concoct it. Um, I think the point is that there is no way that God is going to fail. The army, the force that he has collected, is the biggest army anybody in the world had ever seen and ever will see, 200 million strong. There's, there's not an army on the face of the earth could, that, that could stand in front of it. And uh, we saw the similar kind of uh, number back in chapter 5 and verse 11, the myriads and the myriads of angels, thousands and thousands of them around the throne, that God has got plenty of power to take care of his people. He's got forces at his disposal that are inexhaustible. And so the picture is that uh, God's people need not worry. Is God really going to win? Is he really going to defeat their enemy? You bet. He's got an army that can't be stopped. And in typical fashion, uh, we're told in verse 17 what these uh, troops look like. Verse 17, this is how I, uh, I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire and hyacinth. My understanding is that hyacinth is a blue kind of color, and so maybe the blue is the color of smoke, or maybe the color of blue that you see in a flame sometimes. Um, but they are the uh, color of fire and hyacinth and of brimstone. Uh, fire and brimstone, of course, are commonly paired up a time or two in the Bible. Brimstone is sulfur, what we would call sulfur in the modern world. Uh, but perhaps the most famous allusion to fire and brimstone in all the Bible is Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah where God brings fire and brimstone upon the cities of the plain. Uh, wicked people, as we studied Sunday morning, uh, a people given over to immorality, and we're going to come to that here in verses 20 and 21, that that's what these people are as well, fornicators, sexually immoral, given over to all kinds of lusts. And so like God destroyed wicked cities before, he's going to destroy this wicked city, Rome. And interestingly enough, God threatened Israel with fire and brimstone in Deuteronomy 29, that if you ever go and worship other gods, I'll do this to you. I'll do to you what I did to Sodom and Gomorrah. So it shouldn't surprise us that in this judgment of this idolatrous nation here, that these should make an appearance. Uh, but that's not all. We're told that the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions and out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. Pretty scary looking stuff. And that's the point. Remember we said back when we started our study that you got to use your imagination. And if you can conjure up an image of a horse with a lion's head, and rather than just snorting and, and neighing, it breathes out smoke and fire and brimstone. That's pretty pretty fierce looking horse. And... The point is that, yeah, it's supposed to be fierce, that this is a fearful army 
that these are violent kinds of creatures, not horses, but horses with lion's heads, destructive, powerful, strong, unstoppable, 200 million of them. There is no way that God is going to lose this battle. And remember that this is not a historical army of the ancient world. Uh, There's no need to go through the ancient history books and say, okay, what was there an invasion of Rome from the north in some year? Or was there some country on the northern frontier that was assembling a large army? No, it's not about that. It is a symbol of God's sure destruction of a wicked nation, that God has the power to do it, and he's going to unleash it. That's the message, it seems to me. All right, then. Uh, the description goes on, uh, verse 18, a third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. So what, what does it mean that they were killed? What kind of death? Well, if all of this is symbolic of God's ability to destroy, then maybe the death is not just the death of individual people, but death in all of its forms, that God is unleashing uh, this wickedness on the earth so that it does its work and produces all the things that wickedness produces, illness, hardship, tragedy, physical death included. But remember, uh, we kind of have the, uh, uh, the same kind of image back in the earlier part of chapter 9. In verse 5, the, the torment of these locusts was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. Men will seek for death and it will not, they will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. We suggested that there is psychological elements to this and not just physical. And so it doesn't seem to me that it would be necessary to just limit the death here to, uh, (coughs) physical dying, but that it is the unleashing of all the things that are bad and rotten, and that go along with evil. Um, That would go along, I think, with the rest of the picture that is being painted here. And notice that they are called uh, plagues here in verse 18. Uh, Three plagues that proceeded out of their mouths. So this Exodus imagery, John wants to keep that in front of our minds. And plainly in Several places, I just quoted two of them here, Exodus 6 and Exodus 12, where God refers to the plagues as his judgments against Egypt. And in 12.12, God says, I will execute my judgment, my judgments on the Egyptians and on their gods. And that seems to be especially appropriate to think of here, that God is showing the powerlessness of this wicked nation that relies on false gods and he is judging them for doing so. Uh, Verse 19 goes on with even more detail. The power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. So not only do they have the faces of lions, but they have tails that are for all practical purposes snakes. Strange stuff, right? Um, Mouths in the book of Revelation very often is a symbol of deception. The mouth that speaks lies. We're going to see this later on in the book in chapter 16, chapter 12, chapter 13. Uh, We're going to see in the latter part of the book these images of great and terrifying beasts. Things like dragons and beasts that are full of just all kinds of different parts stuck together. And one of the things that we're going to see about these beasts is that they speak. And when they speak, they always speak lies and they speak blasphemous words. And that seems to be kind of previewed here in this scene. Their power is in their mouths. And the fact that they have tails like serpents suggests that this is also another indication of their deceptive quality because the serpent is associated normally with the deceiver. And as we have studied before and uh, no doubt we'll have mentioned uh, again, this is one of the ways that God deals with evil people. He allows them to receive deception 
As a matter of fact, he makes sure they get it so that they will follow that deception and it will bring about their destruction. We're going to see that more in chapters 13 and 16 very clearly. But it's as if God was saying, okay, you don't want to hear the truth. The only other thing that you're fit to hear is a lie and you're going to swallow it and it's going to destroy you and God is pleased to work that way. Uh, together we have here uh, serpents uh, in their uh, tails and uh, we've also mentioned uh, in this context scorpions as well. Uh, those kinds of things often go together uh, as images of what is notoriously harmful and deadly. So with that, John says, this is what I saw, and the result in verse 20 is that the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. So the plagues are part judgment, but they're still part warning. We see here the mercy of God, that he's not just going to destroy this evil nation without first trying to get their attention and trying to say, you need to turn to me and, and honor me as God, or I'm going to destroy you. So, so the picture is that God is unleashing all of this destructive power, but they're not listening, and they won't repent. And so uh, they continue, it says in verse 20, they did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons. Uh, the worship of demons is an interesting statement. It's actually uh, quite common in the Bible, more than you would think. Deuteronomy 32.17, uh, uh, I think this is Moses describing Baal Peor, they sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known. The parallelism of demons and false gods. Psalm 106.36 they served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. The demons and the idols are obviously the same thing. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 10. The things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. Now when we think of demons, we think maybe of demon possession and these uh, evil spirits that possessed people. The word demon here has just a little bit different sense to it. And the biblical picture from Deuteronomy down through Paul seems to be that these, these false gods that the nations worshipped, they were not just the work of men's hands, they were not just personifications of human desires, but that there really are spiritual beings that correspond to these things, that there are forces of evil in the universe that have nothing other than their desire of greed or power or all the things that men want for themselves, and that to worship these images and these idols is actually to worship these evil forces. And that's how God, or Paul, certainly describes the pagan idols of the Corinthians in their city. That when they go down to the temple of Apollo, it's not some figment of the imagination they're worshiping. It's an evil force in the world that is ultimately behind all of this. And so that's the picture that is here, that... They are actually giving their worship to something evil. It's not, you know, uh, benign. It's not just harmless superstition that this is actually the worship of evil. They take the forms of the idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And, of course, if you've read the Old Testament much at all, uh, you understand that very uh, common jab at idols, that they can't do anything. Jeremiah 2, people who say to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone you gave me birth, for they have turned their back to me and not their face, but in the time of their trouble they will say, arise and save us. And that's kind of the implied picture here. 
that they're not going to give up their worship of these things, but the day is going to come when they wish that these things could save them. Uh, Perhaps one of the more extended parodies of idols is found in Isaiah 44, where Isaiah goes on at length talking about their inability. Uh, Psalm 115, let's go back and look at that passage. Uh, We've got the time to do that tonight. Psalm 115, starting in verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands, but they have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. And here's the punchline. Those who make them will become like them, everyone who trusts in them that you will become just as powerless as your idol if you trust it. There's a sense of that here in Revelation 9, that these people have trusted in nothing and they're going to be brought to nothing. And it seems to me that if you lived in the first century in Asia Minor, that this would have been a very clear allusion to the emperor cult with its statues of the emperors that you would worship with sacrifices and incense, and that you would pray to the emperor, that you would celebrate his birthday as the birthday of the god. Uh, These images of gold and silver and wood and stone, uh, they were all over the ancient world, not just of the classical gods, but of the emperor as well. And so it seems to me that you can make a good case for that here uh, as well. Notice verse 21 They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their immorality or of their thefts. And those are not necessarily sins that are just things that idolaters do, and they're certainly not sins, as far as we know, that are simply associated with the emperor cult in some way. No, I think the point that John is making is that this is the way godless people live. They worship things that are not God at all. And when you worship a false God and a false religion, the result is always sinful living. These are the typical sins of godless people. This is typically what people who have no sense of God do. They kill, they dabble in ways to find out things from other realms, sorcery, uh, they commit sexual sin, and they are, they are thieves. And by the way, uh, we ought to keep that in mind. You know, in our day and age, it's not politically correct to speak of other religions in those terms. But the fact is that if you don't worship the true God, this is the life that you will live. You might not live it tomorrow. You might not live it next year but you are on the path to live that life. Because if you don't worship the right God, you're not going to live the right way. Uh, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10, God uh, said there of uh, Israel, There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft or interprets omens, or a sorcerer. In other words, you're not going to act like pagans as long as you're my people. And uh, even perhaps more to the point are passages like Jeremiah 7 and uh, Isaiah 47. Let's go to Jeremiah 7 and look at that passage. <clears throat> Jeremiah 7, starting in verse 5. If you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, Do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin. Then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you're trusting in deceptive words to no avail. We just saw the horses with the mouths that suggest deception was coming upon these people. And God said that, uh, verse 4, don't trust in deceptive words. If you'll do what's right and turn from what's wrong, I'll let you say, but don't trust in deceptive words. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery and swear falsely and offer sacrifices to Baal and walk after other gods that you've not known? Then come and stand before me. 
same sins that we find here in Revelation chapter 9. People deluded by false worship. Well, that's the kind of thing that we have here of these people. Uh, Paul says in Romans 1, 24 through 29, that that is exactly the way the pagans of his day had become because of their refusal to follow the true God of heaven. God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. And it goes on and talks about all the other sins that they commit during the rest of that chapter. And then in uh, Colossians 3, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. That list sounds kind of uh, similar to the one here in Revelation. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. That is the very picture that is painted here in Revelation chapter 9, that these people really are sons of disobedience. And God has given them opportunity to repent. He's tried to get their attention. He's tried to hurt them without destroying them all, and they just won't listen. So what does God normally do when people quit listening? Yeah, he, he lets them, he, he unleashes his destructive power and destroys them. So the next thing we're going to see in chapter 10 is this scene where John sees a messenger and he's about to speak and he says some things and John is told, don't you write that down. In, a, in other words, this is not something that God is going to do, that the time for mercy is gone. These people won't listen God's not going to give them any more chances. There aren't going to be any more partial judgments unleashed, any more chances for repentance. These people have made it clear that they want to be wicked and God's going to destroy them. And in chapter 11, we're going to find out that at the core of their wickedness is not just sexual immorality and idolatry and um, uh, theft and murder, but the thing that's got God angry in chapter 11 is that they have killed his people. And so John is working very methodically here at this picture of a thoroughly sinful nation that is ripe for judgment and is going to get judged. And nobody will be able to say at the end that they didn't deserve it. All right, well, thanks for again for your good uh, attention. As always, we'll pick up with chapter 10 next time.